Today, class, let's talk about employee motivation, chapter nine. The learning objectives. Know the types of people who tend to be more motivated than others. Learn how to motivate people through goal setting. Understand the importance of providing feedback. Be able to use operant conditioning principles to motivate employees. Understand the importance of treating employees fairly and know the types of individual and organizational incentives that best motivate employees. Now, it should be noted that you do have an exercise this unit, uh, exercise 9-1, where you describe a job, or it could be a class, in which you were motivated to perform well. Why do you think you were so motivated? Describe a job in which you are not very motivated, or a class, and why the lack of motivation. This is sort of like a self-discovery portion of the course. Now, employees will be motivated if the following. They have a personality that predisposes them to be motivated. Their expectations have been met. The job and organization are consistent with their values. The employees have been given achievable goals. The employees receive feedback on their goal attainment. The organization rewards them for achieving their goals. The employees perceive they are being treated fairly in their co-workers demonstrate a high level of motivation. So what we'll discover as we go through this material, that there are certain personality characteristics and traits that tend to make people more motivated. We also understand too is when people meet or live up to our expectations, be it an organization or an individual, we seem to be more pleased and that also gives us the open opportunity to be more motivated. The job and organization are consistent with our values, so there's no conflict with our being highly motivated to achieve. The employees have been given achievable goals, so that these things are not out of our reach. They're things that we can attain. The employees receive feedback on their goal attainment. They're getting feedback constantly to know if they're on target or they're off target. The organization rewards them for achieving their goals, so it notices when you are doing well and it gives you something for it. The employees perceive they are being treated fairly, so there is a sense of justice in the organization, and their coworkers demonstrate high levels of motivation as well. So if other people tend to be motivated, you'll tend to be too at a particular organization. Is an employee predisposed to being motivated? We have personality. Certain personality traits seem to be more associated with being motivated. For example, we have conscientiousness, being careful or diligent with a desire to do a job well. That's what we mean by conscientious. So all things being equal, if we had a measure of conscientiousness, someone scoring low there and someone scoring high, the high score may be more likely to be someone who is predisposed to being motivated. We also look at self-esteem, your sense of self-worth. Some people have certain chronic values of self-esteem. It could be situational as well or socially influenced. Also have need for achievement. Some people have a desire to achieve. And this need for achievement can also lead to a predispose, predisposal toward being motivated. As well as sometimes people are, are intrinsically motivated. They're not motivated because they're getting paid to do something. They're motivated because whatever that job is or that task or whatever they're working toward, there's something inside of them that stokes the fire and gets them going toward this particular activity. And that is intrinsic motivation. So how can we increase, increase self-esteem, for example? Well, you can go to self-esteem workshops or you can experience success. And we tend to get more self-esteem when we have more and more successes. We also see there's the self-fulfilling prophecy, the idea that people behave in ways consistent with their self-image. So if they see themselves as a winner because they've had a few successes, then their self-esteem may also go up as well. It's sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy. The Galatea effect, when high self-expectations result in high levels of performance. So when people expect you to perform well at a very, very high level, you tend to live up toward those ideals. So trying new experiences and taking little steps can be very beneficial. 
If you have high expectation towards those things, you may also have higher levels of performance. Then we can look at supervisor behavior. We have the Pygmalion effect. The idea that if people believe that something is true, they will act in a way or a manner consistent with that belief. So if your supervisor, if you are a supervisor, for example, and you act as if this guy is a really great employee, they will tend to try to live up to that great employee idea that you have of them, the Pygmalion effect. Or we can have the Golem effect. When you have negative expectations of an individual, cause a decrease in an individual's performance. Well, you think this particular employee is no good. You knew it at the interview, but they got hired anyway. The idea is that you may behave in such a way that can even bring that to its uh, truthfulness, that it's now their poor performance. But it's based on your negative expectations. Need for achievement. There are three needs that we want to look at. We have need for achievement, or according to trait theory, the extent to which a person desires to be successful, to be the best. And then we have need for affiliation, the extent to which a person desires to be around other people. And then we have the need for power, according to trait theory, the extent to which a person desires to be in control of other people. So depending on where your needs are in these particular areas, achievement, affiliation, or power, these things will drive you and motivate you. So someone who has high need for achievement, they're striving to be the best. Someone who has a need for affiliation, that's going to motivate them is being around other people, affiliating with other people. The need for power, according to trait theory, these people want to be able to be controlling of other people. They want to be the supervisors, the directors, or the managers, and this is what's going to motivate them. So knowing someone's need in these particular areas gives you some idea of what types of things may be motivating for them. Are employees effectively involved in self-regulating behavior? Self-regulation process. You choose goals and set levels for each goal. You plan how to accomplish goals. You take action toward accomplishing goals or goal striving. And you evaluate progress toward goal attainment and either maintain, revise, or abandon the goal. So this type of self-regulating behavior, this self-regulation process, will be instrumental in having employees that are motivated based on the goals they set for themselves or that have been set. So they choose goals and set levels for each. They plan on how they're going to accomplish these. They take action toward accomplishing the goals. And then they evaluate where they are on a regular basis to either maintain their core course, revise, or abandon the goal. Employee values and expectations. So, have the employee's expectations been met? Well, one of the first things we need to understand is when this employee or potential employee is going to be hired onto the organization, they need to know what the job is really like. One of the most unmotivating type of things around is when you get a job and the job is not what you expected it to be. Your expectations are not being met at all. So it's always a good idea for that potential employee, that job candidate, to receive a realistic job preview to what the job is truly going to be like. And of course, the RJPs help there, as well as a very accurate job description based on what? The job analysis. Have the employee's needs, values, and wants been met? Well, we'll look at some of these, looking at Maslow's needs hierarchy, ERG theory, as well as two-factor theory. So here's Maslow's needs hierarchy. I'm sure you've seen it before. We have the basic biological needs, safety needs, social needs, ego needs, and self-actualization needs as we go up the pyramid. So let's look at these a little bit more closely. So the details of Maslow's need hierarchy. At the very bottom, we have the physical the need for air, water, food, rest, and health. And once those needs have been satisfied, we can worry about security needs. 
This is the way Maslow envisioned this need hierarchy. So then, at the physical, then security needs. The need for safety, shelter, stability. Once that has been satisfied and met, we can then think about social needs. The need for being loved, belonging, inclusion with a group. Once we have all of that, we then can worry about having our ego needs being met. The need for self-esteem, that we are a person of worth, of having power, being recognized for our expertise, being prestigious. Once those needs are met, then we go to a higher level of our hierarchy, self-actualization. The need for development and creativity, being the best version of ourselves that we can be. So now, obviously, we've seen this pyramid for many, many classes now. Uh, not just this class, but other classes I'm talking about. Uh, and so the idea is that this is a very intuitive pyramid. You know, we don't always act that way because sometimes we'll go against the needs hierarchy as, as they as Maslow outlined. For example, we'll go on a hunger strike for a higher principle or ideal, which may go against our physical needs. And that's what this thing doesn't suggest. It suggests that we follow up these hierarchy, and that's the way it is. But we don't always follow it. But it's a good way to frame and understand basic needs that people have, all the way from the physical to the social to how we see ourselves and how we can become the best version of ourselves when it comes to self-actualization. ERG, ERG theory, existence, relatedness, and growth. This is ERG theory. When it comes to existence needs, our desires for physiological and material well-being. Relatedness needs are desires for satisfying interpersonal relationships. Okay, then we have growth needs our desires for continued psychological growth and development. So what they're suggesting here is that we have these needs that we're trying to have met. So very similar in some regards to the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, these needs are focusing on existence, the physiological and material well-being, relatedness, interpersonal relationships with others, and then our own growth, psychological growth and development. Now we have the two-factor theory. The two-factor theory by Herzberg, needs theory, postulating that there are two factors involved in job satisfaction. Two factors, hygiene factors and motivators. Motivators are elements of a job that concern the actual duties performed by the employee, the responsibility, the growth, the challenge, and the job control. Those are motivators. Then we have hygiene factors. Job-related elements that result from, but do not involve the job itself. Pay, benefits, co-workers, and security. So the motivators are directly related to that job. Whereas the hygiene are not directly related to it, but they have some significance. And this is what the significance is. So looking at this hygiene and motivational factors here is this. We have things that can be dissatisfying, okay, which can lead to, of course, lower satisfaction. Working conditions, policies and administrative uh, practices, salary and benefits, supervision, status, job security, co-workers, and personal life. These are not directly related to the job. These are dissatisfiers. These are hygiene factors. Then we have the things which are motivators. The motivators, again, are elements of a job concerning actual duties performed. Recognition, achievement, advancement, growth, responsibility, and job challenge. So one thing leads only to dissatisfier, dissatisfiers, and that's what the hygiene factors are. And the motivators are the only thing that truly can lead to motivating an individual. That's the key point that we see when it comes to the hygiene factors or Hertzberg's hygiene and motivational factors in a two-factor theory. is that one only can lead to dissatisfaction and the other is what leads to motivators. Now, let's look at the comparison of these needs theories. We have Maslow with his self-actualization and ego, which is very similar to ERG growth and two factors motivators. And then we have Maslow's social related to relatedness, 
safety and physical related to existence in the ERG, and the relatedness and existence, social, safety, and physical related to the hygiene factors and the two-factor theory. So there is some degree of overlap here. And so again, these constant theories of motivation, we have Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we have Alfred's ERG theory, growth related to existence, and then we have Hertzberg's motivation hygiene theory, but motivators in hygiene. Then we have learned needs, McClellan's need for achievement, need for power, and need for affiliation. So a few others, we have theories X, Y, and Z. Now, you know, we don't hear much about these as we used to. Now, Theory X is first basically focusing on it is human nature to, according to Theory X, avoid work, need compulsion, sh we won't shrink responsibility, we don't want to be responsible, we seek to be commanded, uh, to value security, and we have a lack of ambition. And commitment is irrelevant. Theory Y, we find work natural, if committed, we show initiative, self-control, self-direction. We seek responsibility. We value creativity. And commitment, people need to commit to the organization. Or we have theory Z, which is the same as Y, but we have the commitments different down here. The organization needs to commit to people. Now, what theories X, Y, and Z are really doing, they're talking about how it is that we view human nature. Now, think about it this way. If you hold to theory X, well, you have a really, really low value of what human nature is. So you are going to be, God, most of us say, we have to be on people's back. We have to watch them all the time to get them to do their job. We can't trust them to. So if you adhere to theory X, then we're talking about a certain, certain stricter type of management style to sort of crack the whip, so to speak. Theory Y, however, says that work is natural. Find work natural if committed to it. So commitment's key. That theory Y suggests that people can show initiative, can have self-control and self-direction and so on. And people need to commit to the organization. Theory Y. Theory Z says the same thing as Y, but we have the organization sort of giving back to the people. So how you hold or view human nature with theories X, Y, and Z will determine a lot about your management and leadership styles as well. But it also dictates here how people are motivated. Motivated by cracking the whip, motivated by having work being a natural part and having them be committed to the organization, or also having the organization commit to them. So again, that's why we see it here. It really says a lot about who we are as people, and sort of suggest what motivates us. Job characteristics theory. Job characteristics theory suggests that certain characteristics of a job will make the job more or less satisfying, depending on the particular needs of the worker. So what they're suggesting is that employees desire jobs that are meaningful, allow you some autonomy, and provide them with feedback. Let me give an example. When I was a, a graduate student working in a, as a consultant for an educational consortium, uh, I w did my own schedule, so I had a great deal of autonomy. The job was very meaningful to me. It was what I wanted to do with my life. I was doing some consulting. I was doing uh, research. I was having client meetings, the whole shebang. And the idea is that there was a great amount of things that I really enjoyed about that job. The job's characteristics were outstanding. It was meaningful to me. I had a great deal of autonomy. My schedule was my schedule. I just had to make sure I met the deadlines. And I got feedback from my boss. Okay, So the idea is that these things can be quite motivating to you. So jobs will have motivating potential if they have the following. Skill variety, task identification, and task significance. So you have a variety of things that you can do. You see where you fit and can identify with the task and the tasks are seen as significant. So the research shows that yes, this does seem to help. So we can look at job characteristics such as skill variety, autonomy, and job feedback with an overall score of motivating potential score. And we can see 
that this is correlated with work behavior, such as degree of satisfaction, and somewhat to performance, okay, as well as negatively related to absenteeism. So when you have higher motivating potential score, you tend to have lower absenteeism. Great. This is what organizations want to know. Now we have setting goals. Goals, I'm sure you've heard of by now. Goals, when they're being set, uh, first of all, if you don't have a goal, you can sort of start floundering around, not knowing what you're supposed to be doing or how well you are doing. So setting goals are very important. The goal should be very specific, nothing general, something that is very specific. You need to accomplish this, A, B, C. They need to be somehow measurable so you can get some sort of judge about how well you're doing. Goals should not be easy to attain, but somewhat difficult to attain. Difficult but attainable, that's the key thing. Meaning that the goal should be a little bit of a stretch for you, okay, so that you have to work a little bit hard in order to achieve it. The goal should be something that is relevant. You should have a time limit based on that. And then the goals should be something that the employer participated in. So specific, measurable, difficult but attainable, relevant, it's time bound so it doesn't have a, a, an open-ended calendar. There's some time frame that you must work in and the employees participated in the setting of the goal. Providing feedback is essential to the whole idea of goal setting. That when you are working on a goal, you want to see how you're doing. And the only way that you know how you're doing toward attaining or achieving this goal is by having some sort of feedback. So the positive feedback should be specific. What did they do? Should be sincere. So you're being truthful. And it should be timely. Negative feedback should be constructive, meaning that it gives them the opportunity to build onto something. It should be uh, concentrate on behaviors only, not personality, things of that nature, which people cannot change or are loath to change or, or at least difficult to change, and always be given in private. So negative feedback in private. And then we have self-regulation theory. Monitor your own progress toward goals and adjust as needed. So one of the key things to goal setting is, of course, the feedback either positive and negative coming from another individual, and self-regulating. Monitor your own progress toward the goals and adjust as needed when you're not on target or you are on target. And you can do other types of things that will help to support you along attaining these particular types of goals. So, we want to reward excellent performance. The timing of the reward, contingency of the reward, the type of reward. All these are very important factors to understand when we're talking about rewarding people. The timing, when do you get the reward, and is the reward based on what type of behavior is contingent upon what, and then the type of reward given. So let's look a little bit at these rewards. First, there's the pre-MAC principle. The idea that reinforcement is relative both within an individual and between individuals, meaning that what reinforces one person may not reinforce the other. And then we see that even within the individuals, there will be different things that reinforce them, along with different things that reinforce different people. So we can get people to engage in behaviors they don't like, and this is the pre bank principle, we can get people to engage in behaviors that, that they don't like, for example, studying, by reinforcing them with the opportunity to engage in behaviors they like better. It doesn't seem, it doesn't say that they like it, period, is to say they like better, okay? So we're comparing what this second uh, reinforcing thing is to the first. So studying, you're stuck in a room and you're studying, uh, but then they say we can get you engaged in behaviors they don't like studying by reinforcing them with the opportunity to engage in behaviors they like better. For example, taking out the trash, at least you're going outside. Now, what this suggests is that we have a hierarchy of reinforcements. Meaning that what is reinforcing to us within an individual, they have a hierarchy, a list. And this is what we have here. So we have the, the most desired things that could be reinforcing to us, like money, time off, lunchtime, 
work next to Wanda, supervise the praise, running the press, to the least desired, like cleaning the press, typesetting, throwing out oily rags, getting printing plates. So what we see here, by having this reinforcement hierarchy, we can reinforce you to do one thing by choosing something that is more desirable here to reinforce it. So the idea here is that we use our understanding of the hierarchy to motivate your behavior. Now, let's remind ourselves what we mean by reinforcement. Reinforcement is any behavior that once you uh, do a behavior, the consequence of that behavior leads the behavior, target behavior to go up. So this is what we're talking about here. In opera conditioning term, we have positive reinforcement where we add some sort of desirable stimulus. Uh, example here, not a work example, but an example to make you understand it. You pet a dog that comes when you call it. You pet it. That's positive reinforcement. Or you pay someone for work done. That's work related. So you reinforce that behavior, okay, by adding a desirable stimulus. Then we can have a negative reinforcement where we remove an aversive stimulus. We take painkillers to end pain. So if you have pain, in order to remove that aversive stimulus, stimulus, you take medicine to get rid of it. Or you can fasten a seat belt to end the loud beeping noise in your car. So loud beeping, fasten your seat belt. That's the behavior that's being reinforced by negative reinforcement, removing something, the loud beeping, which is an aversive stimulus. So I just wanted you to make sure that you remember what we mean by reinforcement, both positive and negative. But here, we're using this reinforcement hierarchy, okay, of things at work, okay, from most desired to least desired, to be able to manage someone's behavior, to motivate their behaviors. There are also financial incentive plans, and of course, a lot can be said with money. We have individual incentive plans where we pay for performance, pay based on how much they, the, they, the individual can produce, merit pay, pay based on performance. We have organizational incentive plans, Profit sharing, get a percentage of the profit. Gain sharing, bonuses based on productivity improvements. Or stock options, options to buy stocks based on when options are granted. So these incentive plans can also be very motivating to people. So we have a variety of ways in which we have theories to describe what tends to motivate individuals, uh, what can we do by way of supervisors and organizations and, and policies within the organization to help people motivate them to do their job or to do their jobs better, to satisfy them to some extent as they do that. And then we also must also look at the other side of it too, punishing poor performance. So let's talk real briefly about this idea. What are the merits of rewarding good performance versus, versus punishing bad performance? So think about that. What are the merits of rewarding good performance versus punishing bad performance? One key idea is this. It's always better to reward or to reinforce. Because the idea here is that you already have an example of the, before, of the behavior that you want. That's why you're reinforcing. They've already demonstrated the behavior or the performance that you want them to do. Okay? That's why you're reinforcing it. But when it comes to punishing bad performance, okay, you only have an example of bad performance. So you're punishing to stop something. So in a way, it's always better to reinforce and reward because at least at that time, the behavior is there. It has been it has been demonstrated by the employee. And what you need to do then is just reinforce it. But if you're going to punish bad behavior, this is probably what should happen. You punish bad behavior, and then you try to reintroduce and reemphasize what you expected them to do. What was an example of good behavior, which would have led to them getting reinforced for it. So as you punish, you need also to remind about what good performance is, so they have that idea in mind. Treating employees fairly, equity, and keeping promises. Now, are rewards and resources given equitably? Let's look at equity theory. Equity theory is a theory of job satisfaction stating 
that employees will be satisfied if their ratio of effort to reward is similar to that of other employees. Think about it this way. Equity is just basically saying, are things equitable? Are you putting in what you're getting out of it? So the components of this theory are the following. We have inputs, the elements that employees put into their jobs. So this is what you are doing for this job. Your blood, sweat, and tears for this job, your inputs. Then you have the outputs, what the employees get from their job, okay, by way of pay, benefits, etc., and so forth. All right. So the key thing when it comes to equity theory is the ratio, your input to output ratio. The ratio of how much employees believe they put into their jobs to how much they believe they get from their jobs. So the possible situations when you look at this input-output ratio are the following. You can see yourself as getting underpayment, overpayment, or equal payment. Everything is copacetic. But let's look at this next slide where we look at examples of when there are underpayment or overpayment. So if we have underpayment, meaning that you are putting more in than you're getting out of it, underpayment, what we tend to see here is this. People tend to work less hard. People tend to become more selfish. And people tend to have lower job satisfaction. That makes sense. Now, if when you do that input to output ratio, and it turns out that you're getting overpaid, this is what we tend to see. First of all, there are no guilt feelings. So you're not feeling guilty because of you getting overpayment in your equity calculation. But you do tend to work harder, and you do tend to become more team-oriented. Now let's look at expectancy theory. Expectancy theory is a theory of room uh, that motivation is a function of expectancy, instrumentality, and valence. Okay? Expectancy, the probability will result in a specific level of performance. Instrumentality, particularly level of performance will result in specific consequence. Valence, perceived desirability of a consequence that results from a particular level of performance. So what this comes down to with this expectancy theory as we wrap this presentation up, an individual will behave or act in a certain way because they are motivated to select a specific behavior over other behaviors due to what they expect the result of that selected behavior will be. In essence, the motivation of that behavior selection is determined by the desirability of the outcome. So they will behave, okay? Their behave, the behavior that they will do is going to be based on the desirability of the outcome or the valence. So we have the probability will result a specific level of performance, and this level of performance will result in a specific consequence, and then the desirability of that consequence. And that's what they choose to select their behavior. That is the driving factor. It's going to be all about what they expect, and that is the key to expectancy theory.